Our scripture today comes to us from Hebrews chapter 12. It says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith because of the joy awaiting him. He endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people, and then you won't become weary and give up. Lord, we pray that anyone feeling weary today would leave this time not wanting to quit, not wanting to give up, Lord, but strengthen God from being in your presence, Lord. Whether it's the scripture read today or a song sung or just you speaking to their heart, Lord, I pray that none of us would leave weary today, but we would leave strengthened in you, God. Our hearts are open to what you're saying. And as we look to the scripture today, God, we ask that after it's all done, we would have been challenged, encouraged, and leave this time a little bit more like Jesus Christ. Come and shape us, God. Come change us. Come mold us, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat this morning here in the building. And those of you joining us online, just invite you to get comfortable as well. Another scripture today is uh, coming to us from Galatians chapter 6. Just very quickly, Galatians chapter 6, starting at verse 7. It says this. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those of the family of faith. Verse 9 again, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Will you pray with me one more time? This morning, God, again, we thank you that you've given us the scripture. And Lord, we believe that it has been given to us by you. And Lord, we pray that as we talk about it today, you would open up our understanding of what it is you're trying to say to us. We thank you for your presence, God. We thank you for your goodness to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, we've been getting some good weather this last week. It's been pretty good. Uh, I've been enjoying that. I don't know about you guys. It's better than, you know, frost on the ground and all that kind of stuff. No? Oh, oh yeah, there's a little. <laughs> we can go back, I'm sure, to the frost on the ground again. But it's been nice to see the sun and feel the warmth and still a little bit of that chill at night. But come July and August, we'll be happy that we get that chill at night, right? Uh, it's been good weather. And uh, this time of year is also the time of year that we start to see all of our kids out there playing, which is an awesome thing to see. Um, and I thought about this this week as uh, kids were running through our neighborhood. It's also the time of year that track and field gets going. And uh, any of you that have children, you know that tryouts are happening. They're getting geared up for track. And my son uh, is uh, in elementary school, and so he's uh, made the team for something. It's not running. I think he's like throwing something. I don't know. What do you call that? It's not discus. It's the other thing. You just, I think they call it like shot put, but it's just like a ball and you throw it. So I don't know what the shot put part of it is, but um, there you go. So he's doing that, and kids are getting ready to compete. And I was thinking about this idea of endurance. 
Just like uh, the writer in Hebrews says to us, you, you know, you need to run the race. That race is, of course, the life that we're living, that God has given to us, the call that he has on our lives. We need to run it with endurance. I was thinking about how, uh, you know, my son, track and field, maybe your kids, but at a very young age, we're taught to run. And we're taught that speed equals success in the race. Whoever gets there first or second or third, you know, you win something. The rest of you, well, maybe not so much. But we're taught at a very young age, whether it's running or other games that we play, that speed equates to success, right? On some level. And it's interesting to me because I don't think that that ever really departs from us. It just begins to look a little bit different. Productivity, the volume of what we accomplished in a certain amount of time, we've bought into the idea that that is always success. Faster is better. I mean, I believe that generally. You probably do too. Faster everything all the time. And then we get convinced, and there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with it, but we get convinced that we need the faster thing. All of us carrying a supercomputer in our pocket today, or wherever you have your phone. I don't know what some of these uh, computer scientists in the room could tell us just what those phones are capable of. It's a lot more than checking email and playing Candy Crush. You do a lot more than that, the processing power of the phone. So why do I need it? Well, I got to send a couple of emails. <laughs> got to write something. Got to take a picture. And yet I've got this phone capable of doing who knows what amazing things. But I, I, need, I need the phone. I need it to be faster. Cars that are so fast, but we cannot drive them as fast as they go. I mean, who's the joke on then? Pay all this money, Bill. We can't even drive it as fast as it'll go. But it says right there on the odometer or on the speed mechanism thing, 240 kilometers an hour. And we're excited about that. It's really interesting though, right? Productivity in our workplace, speed maybe at school, these sorts of ideas, they, they get ingrained in us and that's how we begin to live our life. And there's nothing you know, completely wrong with it. Sometimes it is really important how much we are producing, but there's also a danger there because we begin to rule out other things as progress or as success. It's interesting, there, I was reading a study this week uh, from the business world, and it was about this very thing. It, the idea was businesses that are in it for the long haul. And one of the interesting things that they talked about in the study was how often we measure our employees' work by how much is produced. And we do that over a certain amount of time, and that's a good thing. Performance evaluations annually, sometimes we review results quarterly. But what the study showed was that those things are not the best indicator of that business or organization enduring over the long haul. It's better actually to look at the results of those employees or the company over the longer term and evaluate those successes. And it was really interesting, the case study that they used. They looked at a company uh, that was uh, selling products and they looked at the team that was doing the selling. And it looked on the surface like there was this one employee who was doing amazing jobs because they measured through productivity. And she was making the most calls. She was having the most connections with those who are outside of the organization. And she was consistently at the top. And she was consistently that year getting results. It looked very good. Then there was another employee representing a whole other group. There was another employee who looked like he wasn't doing much. The number of interactions was quite low. The number of sales that year was quite low. But then they said, we looked to the next year. And the story began to change. That employee, she was still doing great, doing what she was doing, very, very productive. But this other employee blew the entire team out of the water, had millions and millions of dollars in sales, and they distilled what took place. And what they found 
It wasn't just one person, this is a broader study, but what they found was these folks were investing in relationship over the long term with prospective clients. So they looked like they weren't doing that much. The sales weren't coming in, they weren't interacting with many, many people, but they had identified clients that would eventually have a need for the product they were selling. And they decided to put, invest in that idea. They are going to need a product, and I want them to come to me. So if I build relationship over the longer term with these folks, and it was right. The point is not that the, the productive person was wrong. She had great sales. But that there's also another way that we're not always measuring, that we're not always thinking about. Fastest isn't always best. But when you look around at our lives, you would think that's absolutely the case. We've said, I don't know about you when you were a kid, but when I was a kid, we would talk about being fast and all this stuff. But then someone would say, the teacher or someone else, but slow and steady wins the race. We don't believe that. We talk about it in school. We teach it. You know, all the, but we don't believe that. We, we want the speed. We want the speed. Nobody is watching the Olympic races for the slow and steady. Nobody's watching the NBA final for the slow and steady. We are watching it for speed, for quickness. It's really interesting, isn't it? But the challenge is fastest does not equate to endurance. Those sustained speeds can't be maintained. Talk to someone who runs a sprint. And they'll say, I can't run it for very much longer than the 100 meters. Fastest isn't always the best. Fastest doesn't necessarily produce endurance. Pastor Ben, he's uh, preaching in St. Margaret's Bay today, and uh, he, we were talking about this this week, this idea of endurance. And some of you will know that Ben is a great runner. He runs a lot. Uh, and I believe even he's completed a couple of marathons in his time running. He runs a lot. If you see me running, look for the fire. <laughs> if I'm running, there's something wrong. But Ben, he runs. He actually runs to work in the, in the summer months. He lives uh, way over in Dartmouth somewhere, and he runs to the church. And it's interesting, this idea of endurance, we got talking about it this week. There's an element of planning that goes into endurance and enduring. If Pastor Ben doesn't you know, get his water ready. Have you guys seen those water vests with the little bottles? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, don't wear one. Unless, unless you're Ben and you can run 10 kilometers or a marathon, don't wear one. It's one of those cases where if you need it, then it looks cool. But if you don't need it, can you imagine me wearing one of those out for a walk? That'd be pretty funny. But if Ben doesn't plan and fill up the water bottles, make sure he's got the good sneakers on, because they do wear out after so many kilometers. If he doesn't plan, he can't complete the run. And it's really interesting to me because I think we face a similar challenge in, in life in general, that if we're not planning to endure in our career and to get to the end of what God may have called us to, we're not necessarily going to get there. And scripture shows us and demonstrates this kind of concept to us. And it becomes that much more important for the spiritual life that we are living. The writer of Hebrews says, run the race with endurance. Don't give up. It's Galatians, it's Paul writing to us, don't give up. You will reap a harvest. What if you don't give up? The quitters are those who don't have endurance. They're not evil. They want to get there and reach the end, but they can't make it. And I believe part of the reason is because they haven't planned to make it. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, talked about how we should orient our lives and what we should orient our lives around. And it is not material things. It's not the secular systems of the world. Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. And sometimes treasure in heaven doesn't excite us all that much, if we're honest, because we don't see it in the here and now, and it's not instant, it's not fast, it doesn't come to us when we want it. It's something that we lay up over the long haul, 
in God's presence. And one day when we are with him, we will receive that great, great reward. And so Jesus says, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where uh, rust and moth can't destroy. Yet we often, myself included, we're often busy laying up treasure down here, which we justify the reasons for. And our effort goes into the things that are temporary, and we are not planning to endure. We're planning for this life. But what about the life to come? Part of this idea of enduring spiritually has to do with planning. And we see this in the scripture time and time again. Jesus himself said, I do the things I see my father doing. I do the things I hear my father speaking. There's an element of Christ communing with God the Father, hearing what was needing to be done and heading out and doing it. We see this all over the New Testament, in particular through the book of Acts. I encourage you, we've said this a few times over the last number of months, as we're all trying to grow in the Lord, take some time and maybe read Acts like in one or two sittings and just read through it a little bit quickly because what will happen is you'll begin to look at the scripture through a broader lens of like the big things that happened, the trips that happened and where people maybe interacted. It's good to do that, it's a good exercise. And what you'll come to see is Paul was all over the place, but there were plans. I can think of the Macedonian call, a plan that got changed. He was planning to go into Asia, and God said, no, you're going to go this way. And so the Spirit spoke to Paul. Paul changed plans and adjusted them, and then they went to Macedonia. And we know by reading the epistles as well as the book of Acts, there were people there to greet him. There were plans that were made before he came. When he sent letters, he affirmed people for giving and for hosting him. There was an element of planning in those trips. It seems like a very basic thing. And it is, but it's not shiny and bright and attractive to most people. It's boring, planning. It takes discipline, planning does. And it's important for us in a spiritual way to do the same. What is it that the Lord has called us to do? It may be expressed in the career that you're in or what you're studying. What has he called you to do? And are you planning to endure to the end? Or are you just wishing and hoping that you'll, you'll make it? Jesus again said in Matthew 6, we need to orient ourselves around the, the kingdom and around eternal things. So are we living our lives for the long haul? If we want to endure, we've got to have that kind of mentality. And the question is, do we today? Or how are we doing with that? We see in the Old Testament when God invited Moses to deliver the people and then later on to build the tabernacle and David later on the temple, there was plans and they're very detailed plans. Sometimes we can have this idea that this amazing God we serve and he is amazing just, just does things. And it seems like that sometimes. But through scripture, we see that there are plans. And I believe that we are meant to reflect that same thing. The scripture also tells us in Galatians chapter six, we've read it already, that we will reap the great reward if we, what, don't give up. If we don't give up. Planning is a part of not quitting. It's so much easier to walk away from something when we haven't signed off on the dotted line, right? Contracts, they're plans. Building a house, you better have some plans. Even I know that, and I'm not an engineer or know how to build anything. But you don't just walk in there, look at the lot and say, oh, we're just going to throw up some two by fours on this foundation that we... No, you've got to plan. Jesus echoes this when he said, build your house on the rock. Plan to build over here. Don't plan to build over there. It's not going to work well for you. Sometimes I feel so strongly that we quit on the things God has called us to because we never truly planned to endure until the end.
And all the while, we miss out on things and disappointment runs deep or we feel like we haven't made it. And God, where are you? We're waiting on you. We're waiting to see you do what you do, God. Then we'll do what we do. It doesn't work like that. So many of us have been raised to be these wait and see Christians. Let's just wait on the Lord and see what he will do. And then we'll do whatever. That's not faith. It's not faith. It doesn't take faith to do that. Faith is a level of risk. Otherwise, it's not faith. Otherwise, we're resting on our own abilities to do things. And that leads us to a place of humanism and doing things in our own strength, not through Jesus Christ and the great things that he has called you and I to do. But it takes a measure of discipline and planning to endure until the end. I remember I, not long ago, it was probably a month or so, I was having a meal with uh, a number of other friends who are Christians, believers, strong believers. Some of you actually would even know some of them and be like, oh, man, that, that person's awesome. They have such great faith. And we're, we were sitting and talking uh, about um, challenges that different ones were facing and these sorts of things. And Paul writes in Philippians chapter 1, I think it's around verse 12, he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so we were talking about all these challenges we face and the difficulties, and at one point I just said, you know, but you know what, guys, really, to live this life, yeah, Christ is here with us, and we have that demonstration of who he is, but truly, to die is gain. And everybody just stopped. It was like I had said the worst thing ever. Like I cussed them out all of a sudden. Pastor Paul using this horrible language. What are you? I just looked at them. I said, guys, it's scripture. It's what Paul said. It's how he framed his life. I can go through the challenges I go through because of what awaits me in God's presence. And I think sometimes we're not planning around that. We are planning around what is here and now and temporal. And we cloak it in things that are spiritual, like the prosperity message, not the true message of prosperity, but wealth and health and all of that stuff. Some of you know what I'm talking about. And we've equated these results in the temporal with spirituality, which is a lie from the pits of hell. It is not the truth. And how do I know that? Because what about the billions of people who live on this planet who have zero material wealth, but a faith that is so on fire for God, people are coming to know him through their lives daily. What about those folks? All of a sudden, your prosperity message falls apart. We've got a plan to endure, but planning to endure means that we've got to live our life the way God called us to. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, let's lay down our lives a living sacrifice and goes on to say that be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform to this world. We can say it the opposite way, conform to what God has planned for you. It's the only thing we should be wrapping ourselves around is him. Yet, we get drawn away every now and then by being fastest because it's what is rewarded in our society. And you know what I'm saying. Fastest may not be exactly what's happening in your workplace, but it's the material things of this world. It's the instant gratification of the results that we might pull together. And it's not kingdom-oriented. It's oriented around this world. And I believe if we want to endure, to get to the end of the journey that God has us on, if we want to complete the race well, we need to allow our lives to be led of the Spirit, and we need to plan to get to the end. I just want to invite the band to come on back as we get ready to close here in a couple of moments. There's a guy named Louis Zamperini. Some of you might know that name. And Louis was born in 1917. He immigrated to the United States with his family to California. 
And uh, Louis, when he was in grade school and this sort of thing, he was what we would say a troubled child. Misbehaved a lot, was bullied a lot, would get into fights a lot. And now with our, our modern understanding, we, we probably have a better understanding as to why. He didn't speak any English and was in an English grade school. And so we can imagine the challenges, right, that flow out of that. And so he was bullied. And him telling the story, he said he learned very quickly to get even, to get even with people. That was his plan. You wrong me, I'm going to wrong you back in equal measure, at least. And so he faced lots of challenges through school and the folks in authority of that school just didn't know what to do with him until someone thought, hey, maybe like, what's the deal with all this aggression? Maybe we can see it channeled in a different way. And so they invited Louis. Yes, come on up here. Yeah, you just run your race. Run it well. Run it well, George. There you go. Let's go, George. Yeah. You got there. Amazing. Amazing. Louis got invited to be on the track and field team, just like little George. And all that energy got channeled into running. And he had a knack for it. He was good at it. Began to run long distance. And all of a sudden, this individual who seemed completely lacking in discipline was planning to endure the race, showing up at practice, doing all the things that he needed to do to, to win. And winning wasn't necessarily being the fastest. All, it, winning was enduring, was getting to the end of that long distance. In a short period of time, just to make the story a little bit shorter, Louis began to hold records. First, it was state records, university records. Then it became national records. And then in 1936, he was invited to be part of the Olympic team and go to the Olympics in Berlin. And he went and he ran and he made it to the finals and he placed eighth. I believe it was the mile run, maybe even the next race up from that. I can't remember the distance, but it was longer. He did well and people were raving about this young person, particularly the way he finished his race with the idea in mind that he will be back. This isn't his only Olympics. And so he fixed his eyes on the Olympics that were supposed to happen in 1940. He fixed his eyes on that and was preparing and was ready. But many of you, any of you, in fact, who know your history a little bit, know what happened, the Second World War. And so Louis found himself not in the race that he wanted to run. He found himself in the Air Force, flying airplanes, and again, this young kid who had been no discipline in his life, caused challenges, found himself succeeding again. It was said of him that he, would, he had nine lives because his plane would take enemy fire over and over, but he would still land his plane. It happened all the time. And then there was this mission that came up. Uh, it was a rescue one. They had to send a plane out and... They sent Louis out, 10 of his colleagues, and their plane crashed into the Pacific Ocean. On impact, eight of his friends died, eight of his colleagues, fellow officers, three survived. And he tells the story of like he was in the, in the ocean and was trying to swim to the top of the ocean. And, and he finally gets there and then he sees in the distance, there's a life raft, one of the rafts from the plane had inflated like it should, and it's over there. And he knew that is, that's life right there. That, that is life. I got to get to this raft. He gets to the raft and then rescues his two other colleagues and friends. Planning to endure. 47 days later, one of the officers had passed away. These three men had lost more than half their body weight. They had learned to survive off of whatever they could get from the sea. 47 days later, 
Some 20 days in, they, there was an airplane that was coming and they tried in desperation to get their attention and they succeeded in getting their attention, only it was the enemy and they began to fire on the life raft. And miraculously, nobody, none of the three were killed. And some 20 more days later, 47 in total, they see land. We're talking about enduring to the end. And so they tell the story. They had no zero strength, not able to do anything. They're just drifting. And he says, we came up to land and we were relieved. And they were brought out of the raft by their enemy. They had not floated into friendly territory, but past enemy lines. And they were taken, not rescued, but put into prison and tortured, meant to be broken. Louis tells a story. You can YouTube it. I encourage you to check it out later on today. And he talks specifically, or uh, others report specifically on the horrible things that he endured. And the enemy found out uh, not too long into his stay who he was. And if you know anything about warfare, particularly in this time of history, propaganda was such a huge part of it. And so the enemy was super happy because here we have an American Olympic athlete. We have a champion, a world record holder. His family and friends back in America had given up on him, on his survival. In fact, even the president had signed his death certificate. And then broadcast from around the world comes his voice on radio, telling his family he's alive, telling his story. After that, the enemy wanted him to read propaganda, and he refused to do it. And so they set about breaking him. It became their project to break this man. The war ended, Louis survived, made his way home. His life, the topic of the movie, Unbroken. Some of you may have seen it back in 2014. Louis comes home and what the movie doesn't tell you, he comes home and he feels like maybe he can sweep all this stuff under the rug and move on with life like so many of us want to. There are challenges and traumas and difficulties that we have faced and we just, we just wanna move on. And so he comes home, he's welcomed as a hero as he should be. He gets married, he has kids, starts a, a wonderful life. But he tells the story how every night he was back in the prison camp being tortured. Every night he would have nightmares, every single night. And he turned to alcoholism to numb that pain and to help him sleep, was addicted. Until one day his wife said to him, she was going to divorce him unless he went to church with her. She had recently become a Christian and she said, I will stay, but you need to come to church with me. She took him to a Billy Graham meeting. And in that meeting, Louis came to know Christ. He says later, I challenge any atheist or agnostic to get in a raft in the middle of the ocean. You will believe in God very quickly. What we believe philosophically is all fine as we sit in the comfort of our living rooms and the comfort of the, what we have that the government provides, even though we get frustrated with the government. As we sit in our comfort, it's easy. But when our life is at risk, we try everything. He said he knew that this was the way received Christ every single night. For the rest of his life, he says, never had one single nightmare. Not only that, he endured. He became, began to learn what endurance was really about. And it was about not all the things that he did, because he did endure in every sense of the world when it comes to this life. He endured, he ran the races and won. He endured a childhood that wasn't perfect. He endured torture. He endured 47 days in the ocean. He endured enemy fire, endured all those things, yet learned something greater, spiritual endurance. And it shows up like this. In 1950, Louis went back to the prison camps. He went back to enemy territory, and he met with those who tortured him. 
and he forgave them. A number of those officers came to know Christ. This is the story that Louis tells. He died in 2014 at the age of 97. We want to talk about endurance, not about the here and the now. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. And if we don't believe that, we have some work to do with the Lord. It's not fatalistic. Don't buy into that nonsense. It is not fatalistic to make that statement. It is a faith statement that what we see in the here and now pales in comparison to what awaits us in God's presence. He is real. And we are living this life for His glory. But it's up to us to make plans to endure. I just want to invite you to stand with us as we wrap things up today. John's going to come and we're going to sing for a few moments. And I want to invite you to come for prayer. The prayer team is available today at the back of the room. Some available here at the front. Come and be prayed for. Allow the Lord to work in your life today. Lord, we thank you for your word to us. God, we pray that it wouldn't be something that we've heard today and is gone tomorrow. But Lord, the things that you have wanted us to see and to hear, Lord, I pray that they would grow in our hearts and lives and that we would then one day reap the harvest, God, of this life that you have invited us to live because we haven't given up. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would sustain us and come and continue to speak to us in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen.